Welcome to Oil and Gas Law with Energy Law Prof. In this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit more about the marketable product rule, which determines whether the oil and gas company can charge the lessor, the landowner, for a portion of those post-production costs. So as a reminder, there's a split between the jurisdiction between states like Texas that follow the capture and hold rule, which says that natural gas is produced when it gets to the wellhead and it's captured. And so that means that all the expenses that the oil and gas company puts into the natural gas after that point, compressing it, transporting it, processing it, taking out the sulfur, the landowner can be required to pay for his or her share of those costs. And that's contrasted with states that follow the marketable product rule. And that includes states like Kansas, like Colorado. And in those states, the natural gas isn't actually produced until the natural gas company takes steps that increase the value of that natural gas and make it marketable so that it can be sold. So in those states, if you as a landowner get one eighth of production, you're getting one eighth of the value of that natural gas after it's been compressed, transported to a market where it's worth more, processed, had the sulfur stripped out of it, etc. And so that can be more favorable to the landowner in that circumstance. Now, what we'll focus on in this lesson is if you are in one of these states and you would like to have the rule from the other state, how do you make that clear in your lease? Now, you might say, if I'm a landowner and I'm in a state with the marketable product rule, why would I want the capture and hold rule? Well, remember, it's a negotiation. And so you may have to give on one part to get something more on the other part. And so as a landowner, you might be okay with a capture and hold rule, even in a marketable product state, if that meant more bonus, more royalty, etc. Now, let's look at a case from West Virginia where they follow the marketable product rule. This is described on page 261 in your book. You just have the notes. And in this case, here's what the lease said, that the landowner would receive one eighth of the price of natural gas, net all costs beyond the wellhead and less all taxes, assessments, and adjustments. Now, if you just looked at that language, you might say, okay, that's saying I just get one eighth of the value at the wellhead. Is that the capture and hold rule or the marketable product rule? That's the capture and hold rule, right? That's the value just at the well of the natural gas before all the things have been done to the natural gas to make it more valuable. And so you might say that although West Virginia is a marketable product rule state, this lease seems to say that the landowner is going to just get the value of one eighth of the natural gas captured and held at the well. So basically following that Texas rule. But the Supreme Court of West Virginia disagreed. It said, look, in our state, the rule is the marketable product rule. So the default rule is that if you have one eighth of production, you get one eighth of the natural gas, even after all those steps have been taken to improve that natural gas. And if the oil and gas company and landowner want to negotiate for a different rule, they want to negotiate for that capture and hold rule from Texas, they're going to have to be very clear because Remember, we think that usually the oil and gas company, the lessee, has more power in these negotiations. And so we don't want the landowner to be tricked into agreeing to this capture and hold rule if they didn't really understand it. And so the Supreme Court says, look, if you want to follow the capture and hold rule, it's not impossible, but here's what you're going to have to do. One is you're going to have to explicitly say that the lessor will bear part of the cost incurred after the wellhead and between that and the point of sale. And so clearly when they say it's got to be explicit, they mean it's got to be more explicit than it was in this example lease where it said net all costs beyond the wellhead. Second, the oil and gas company is going to have to identify which particular deductions it's going to take from the value of that ultimately marketable product, right? Is it going to deduct for the cost of processing, for the cost of transporting, for the cost of compressing? And then third, the oil and gas company also has to indicate how it's going to calculate those expenses. Is it going to be a cost per MMBTU of gas based on the cost it paid to a pipeline company for this gas? What if it's an affiliated company, etc.? So the oil and gas company is going to have to make very clear to the landowner that he or she is going to bear a part of these costs 
and what those costs are and how they will be calculated. Okay, now let's look at the flip side. So that was an example of a lease in a marketable product state that tried to follow the capture and hold rule. What if you're in Texas where we have the capture and hold rule and you want to say, no, I don't want the value of the natural gas at the well. I want the value of the product when it was eventually sold for more money. So just as an example, as we go into that, remember the example we talked about in an earlier lesson. Let's imagine that we have some natural gas that we're trying to figure out what the value of that natural gas is. We know it was sold for $3 an MMBTU eventually, but that was far from the well. And roughly a dollar per MMBTU had been spent to make it worth $3. And so we would say that the value at the well was $2. So remember the question that we're considering in these post-production cost cases, these cases for costs that are expended after the natural gas comes to the wellhead is does the landowner receive their royalty, their 1A share or whatever other share from that final price that's paid $3 or this price at the wellhead that we calculated by taking the final price and subtracting out the cost of transporting, processing, et cetera, the natural gas. All right, so let's imagine we're in Texas and we know we have the capture and hold rule, but we want the marketable product rule. Here's a case that's exactly on that issue. It's from Texas, it's from 1996. It's on page 366 in your book. You only have this in the notes, not in its full version, but it's worth focusing on a little bit because there are very few cases that come up in conversation with oil and gas lawyers more than heritage resources. I think that's really for a couple reasons. One reason is that because natural gas is hard to price, because it's priced varies so much from place to place, there's frequent legal disputes about the value of a natural gas royalty. So even though natural gas is actually a minority of the oil and gas industry, if you look at where the value is, more of it is often in oil. But if you look at where legal disputes are, there's frequent legal disputes over natural gas royalties because they're hard to price. I think the second reason that you often see discussion of this case is that the result the Texas Supreme Court reached here is a little bit counterintuitive. And so that makes it a bit of a puzzle for oil and gas lawyers. And I think it's important that you understand why the court reached the result it did here. All right, this lease, it was written actually by a bank that was leasing land for its landowners. So the bank, you know, sophisticated lessor, presumably, presumably they want to get the most value for their lessor, for their land owner. Here's what the lease said. The gas royalty shall be the market value at the well, but there shall be no deductions from the value of the lessor's royalty by reason of any required processing, cost of dehydration, compression, transportation, or any other matter to market such gas. Look carefully at that provision. Really, there's two provisions. One says that the royalty will be the market value at the well, and the second says there shall be no deductions from the value for all the costs of processing, dehydration, or compression. Now, if you just looked at that first term, market value at the well, would you think they're following the normal rule in Texas, which is capture and hold, or do you think they're following the marketable product rule? This is clearly following the normal capture and hold rule because it says it's the value at the well, okay? Value at the well is the normal capture and hold rule. Now, let's say you just looked at that second provision. There shall be no deductions from the value of the lessor's royalty by reason of any required processing, dehydration, compression, transportation, etc. That sounds a lot more like the marketable product rule because it says you aren't going to deduct these costs from the value of the lessor's royalty. I think what happened here is that the lawyer was trying to ask for the marketable product rule. The problem was they apparently weren't paying that much attention in their oil and gas class and they mistakenly included this language at the well that says that you don't receive that final value, you receive the value at the well that you just received that $2, not that $3. 
Now, how would you resolve this if you were the court? What does this lease really mean if you look at these words? Well, one theory, and the theory that the lessors, the landowners were arguing for here is, look, okay, these two provisions, maybe they're inconsistent. If they're inconsistent, you should follow the one that's more specific, which says that there shouldn't be any deductions. And so I should get that marketable product rule. I should get that $3 value rather than the $2 value. Now, the court disagreed. The court says, no, the, there's actually no difference. It's not like one of these is more specific. They actually can be read in concert, which is to say, Market value at the well, we know what that means. And we know that follows Texas law. You get the value at the well, you get those $2. It's entirely consistent with that to say there won't be any deduction from the value of the lessor's royalty. The lessor's royalty is that lower value, which is $2. And we're not gonna take any further deductions from that. Now, of course, there would be no reason to take further deductions from that value at the well, because you've already subtracted out all the value of processing it, et cetera. But that basically makes this second phrase surplus because it wasn't really necessary. The result here was determined by the language at the well. Now, I think it's fair to say that's probably not what the person writing this intended, but it does seem to reflect the literal meanings of the words that they used. And so effectively, what the Texas Supreme Court here is saying is said, well, when you said that you wanted the value at the well, we're gonna give you that $2 value at the well. Now you said you didn't want to have the dollar per MMBTU subtracted from your $2 at the well. So we're not gonna subtract it and give you actually just $1 after we take your value at the well, because it's already been subtracted to determine what your value at the well is, and it's $2. And so you can imagine, however, that the landowner was really unhappy about this. And in fact, a lot of lawyers were unhappy about this decision because they said, look, I said I wanted no deductions from my value of my royalty. I wanted this full $3 in MMBTU. The problem is that the lease literally said that it, the value of the royalty was determined at the well. And to get that value, of course, you subtract the dollar from the $3 here. You don't further subtract, but all you're left with is that $2 and MMBTU. So I think this is a case where the court was faithful to the literal meaning of the text drafted by the attorneys, but probably not to what the attorneys were likely intending to do. And I think it emphasizes the importance of watching the terms in the lease. Effectively, what happened in this lease is that the lawyers added this language about no deductions, but forgot to change the language that said at the well. And the at the well language determined the result here. It meant you only get, you know, as an example, that $2 rather than that $3. Okay, here's another case discussed in your notes. I would actually encourage you to go ahead and just read the full case because it's a good example of how the Texas courts will argue about the meaning of a lease with difficult to interpret provisions. But you can see there's a short description of it at page 367 in your book. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail. You can just treat that more detail kind of as a hypothetical. So in this lease, the lease said that the royalty holder would get a perpetual cost-free, except in its portion of production taxes, overriding royalty of 5% of gross production. And the parties agree that heritage resources shall not apply to this lease. Okay, remember that an overriding royalty, typically a royalty created out of the leasehold interest. But I want you to focus on this language and think about, does this mean a capture and hold rule where we take that $2 value at the well? Or is this trying to give 5% of the value of the royalty once it's sold, of that marketable product. Note this disclaimer, heritage resources shall not apply to this lease. 
what do you think the parties meant by this? Well, maybe they meant heritage resources applied the capture and hold rule, even though the parties may have wanted the marketable product rule. And so they're trying to avoid that result here by saying this decision of the Texas Supreme Court won't apply. Let's look at some of the other provisions here. Okay, Chesapeake, the oil and gas company says, hey, maybe you were trying to write a royalty again that gave you the marketable product rule. But again, if you look at the literal terms here, it seems that you've written a royalty that only gives you the value at the well. Here's why. First of all, this language about cost-free, that's basically surplus. Yes, it's a cost-free royalty. Every royalty is free of the cost up to the wellhead. So remember, when an oil and gas company pays a royalty, it doesn't deduct the cost of drilling the well, of fracking the well, of operating the well. The only question is whether it gets to deduct costs after the well, those post-production costs between the wellhead and where the natural gas is ultimately sold. And so Chesapeake says here, cost-free just means like a normal royalty, you don't pay production costs. Second, Chesapeake says, look, this is 5% of gross production, of production. What does production mean in Texas? The natural gas is produced at the well. That's what that means. So when you say 5% of production, you're getting 5% of the value at the well. So that lower amount, maybe $2 rather than $3 that it was sold for. Also, there's another provision of this royalty that says that the royalty holder can get the natural gas in kind. And obviously, if the royalty holder got the natural gas in kind, it's going to have to pay for all the transport processing of the natural gas itself. And so Chesapeake says, it just makes sense. If we take steps to improve that natural gas, the landowner should help pay for it, just like they would if we just gave them the natural gas itself in kind. The hiders disagree. They say, look, a royalty is already free of production costs. So when it says cost-free, that means free of post-production costs, costs after the wellhead. And secondly, they say, look, obviously the parties agreed that heritage resources won't apply to this lease. So they were trying to say, look, we don't want that situation that happened in heritage resources where, you know, maybe we made a mistake, but we were trying to use the marketable product rule, but the court went ahead and applied the, uh, the capture and hold rule from Texas. Okay, so that's the big dispute here. Here again, the oil and gas company is saying, look, you asked for 5% of production, so you get 5% of that $2 value at the well, whereas the hiders are saying, no, it's supposed to be cost-free. Okay, we already know that all the costs up to production, so everything to drill and frack that well, that is paid for by the oil and gas companies. They can't deduct it. But when they said cost-free, that is basically for all costs after the wellhead. And what this lease is saying when it says that it's cost-free is that I don't pay any of these post-production costs. Sometimes you'll see people abbreviate this, PPCs. I don't pay those post-production costs. All right, so how does the court deal with this? Well, first, here's what the majority decides. This is a split decision. It's 5-4. It's the narrowest possible majorities. But the majority here sides with the royalty owner. First, however, they say, look, we agree with the dissent here. We're all in agreement. This heritage disclaimer, where you say heritage resources, doesn't apply. That's irrelevant. Well, why is that? I mean, think about this. Heritage resources wasn't a substantive rule of law. Heritage resources didn't say you can't contract for the marketable product rule if you want it. What heritage resources said is if you look at the literal words you use and follow logic, they are literally contracting for the value of the natural gas at the well. So heritage resource wasn't a rule of law that came in and changed Texas's practice about what kind of leases were allowed. Instead, it was just following 
logic. And so you can't say, hey, the rules of logic don't apply to my lease. And here's a practice pointer. If you ever find yourself writing into a lease that the binding decisions of the Supreme Court of your jurisdiction don't apply to that lease, you're probably misunderstanding something, and I would think again, it's probably not going to help you in any way. I mean, think about what it would mean in practice in this case. Think about if the Heritage Resources exact case came up again, and there was a provision in the lease that said Heritage Resources doesn't apply. Well, the Supreme Court could say, okay, fine, it doesn't apply, but we're still going to reach the same decision. We're the same justices that were here last year. So, it doesn't help to disclaim heritage resources. The majority and dissent agree on this. Okay. The majority, however, says, you know, I understand this argument, Chesapeake, that cost-free could just be redundant words just to emphasize that this is your regular no production cost royalty, as in any royalty you as an oil and gas company, don't get to deduct the cost of drilling or fracking the well. But here, the lease says cost-free, except that Chesapeake can deduct production taxes. And under Texas law, under our previous decision, production taxes are post-production costs, right? They're those costs beyond the wellhead. And so when it says cost-free, except for production taxes, it means free of those post-production costs, except for production taxes, which is one of those production costs. Finally, the court says, look, yeah, the hiders, if they got the gas in kind, of course they're gonna have to pay these costs, but that's not relevant. They had the choice about what kind of, uh, how to get this gas, and they chose the more valuable method, which gives them that cost-free royalty, which is free of all post-production costs uh, other than production taxes. Okay. As I said, it's a closed decision. What's the argument of the dissent? Argument of the dissent keyed to this short description of the royalty, which says it's 5% of gross production. In Texas, production is the production of natural gas at the well. That's what it means under Texas law. They say, you know, this other provision that says cost-free, you know, we're not 100% sure what they meant by that, but it might have meant here no production costs. And the reason for that is there is this exception for production taxes. The majority takes that as meaning, oh, cost-free must mean post-production costs because production taxes are a post-production cost. But they may have misunderstood our precedents and thought that production taxes were a production cost, a cost before the wellhead. And so they might have seen the need to say, look, we're not paying any of the production costs like normal except for production taxes. And here it's the dissent's a little bit funny. It says the majority's opinion all turns on the fact that under our precedence, production taxes are a post production cost. But it's a little funny that the majority thinks that these lessor and lessee writing this lease were being so carefully attentive to our precedents when in fact they said one of our key precedents on this issue shouldn't even apply to this lease. So you, you'll note the sarcasm in the dissent that says, we really doubt that this was done out of studied fidelity to our precedents. Here's a very crucial point from the dissent. The dissent says, look, it's not that hard to get a marketable product rule in Texas. All you have to do is say that you want a percentage, let's say 5%, of the price actually received upon sale. The problem in both Hyder and in Heritage Resources is that in the lease, there was language that tied the value of the royalty to the value at the well. In Heritage Resources, it literally said one eighth of the value at the well. That was what got the lessor in trouble. In Hyder, what made this a close case was that it said 5% of production and production in Texas means production at the well. So practice pointer, if you want to write a lease and you want to get one eighth or whatever percentage of that 
final marketed value, what it's actually sold for. That's what you need to say. Don't say anything tying it to the value of production or to the value at the well. Instead, just say, I want 5% of the price actually received upon sale. So this isn't so difficult to do, but you do have to be very careful about your words because as we can see from these cases, there, if you're not watching them carefully, you may say something that ties the value of your royalty to the value at the well, even if really what you wanted was that higher value, say $3 rather than $2, that higher value where the natural gas is actually sold after being transported, after being processed, after it has reached its full marketed value.